one time we compromise, and they can be treated with pacings most of the time, but sometimes, especially in early few hours, because it is basically more, because of increased vagal tone, atropine can also be tried. So mechanical complication is again an important component of uh, treating patients with STEMI. There are small subsets of patients who can suddenly deteriorate with worsening heart failure, hypotension. Clinically, you may have few clinical signs of maybe systolic murmur. Point of care echocardiography is important to identify what, whether there's a mechanical complications or patient has a global LV dysfunction related, uh, patient has a gross heart failure. If there's a MR because of ruptured papillary muscles or ruptured septum or free wall rupture, they need to be. Stabilize immediately by use of oxygenation, mechanical ventilation, ionotropes. May, they may require circulatory support, after load reducing agents, but they need to be taken for the surgery because until and unless you correct the basic underlying mechanical complication, even patients appear to be stable, suddenly sometimes they can become unstable, so they need to be subjected to surgery early. So secondary prophylaxis, for example, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, MRAs are important component in uh, patient post uh, STEMI patients. It is class two indication in all patients, but there are certain subgroup of patients where they need to be, uh, uh, should, one should ensure that they are on beta blockers, RAS inhibitors, MRA, particularly those with low ejection fractions, clinical signs of heart failure. And uh, so statins, again, is an important part of secondary prevention. Basically, statin helps in stabilization of the plaque, rethrombus formation. There are studies to show statins reduces the risk of reinfarction, death, and oral cardiovascular events. So dose of statin which uh, one has to use is the high intensity dose, like atorvastatin if you are using, it has to be used to 40 to 80 milligrams, dose was statin almost 20 to 40 milligrams, and it has to be carried out lifelong. So I think I had kept some cases, uh, if you wish to undergo, otherwise I'll just close it here. One case. So this is a just hypothetical case, a 60-year-old male patient presented with symptoms of chest pain of two hour duration, and no history of breathlessness, not a known past history of diabetic hypertensive, and there's no uh, past history of angina on exertion. So this is a fairly uh, coming very early, and on examination, why is hemodynamic status is normal, normal blood pressure, normal heart rate, no signs of heart failure, and this is the ECG showing the ST segment elevation in the inferior leads and depression in the, uh, the, the anterior leads. So these are basically features suggestive of inferior myocardial infarction. And his random blood sugar is normal. Blood samples were drawn, as I told you, for estimation of the renal functions and uh, electrolytes and lipid profile. If you do the risk, TMA risk scoring, it is coming to be 1 out of 14. So it is a very small risk. So this patient really does not read, uh, need uh, the PCI. He is coming early. Low risk patient, thrombolytic therapy should be the idea. And uh, here approach, once you have diagnosed the acute MI, patient should be connected to the ECG monitor to monitor for the arrhythmia, establish IV excess, and uh, give loading dose of aspirin, 300 milligram uh, of clopidogrel, give IV anoxaparin, 30 milligram bolus, and followed by 12 hourly, uh, to, to, I mean, uh, one milligram per kg. And uh, we need to quickly assess the contraindication for thrombolytic therapy, whether the patient has a hemorrhagic stroke in the past, ischemic stroke in within six years, any history, I mean, evident history of uh, space occupying lesion in the brain. So these are some of the contraindications. If they are none, then give IV, second gen preferably second generation thrombolytic therapy and high dose statins. And you need to assess the uh, success of thrombolytic therapy at the end of 60 to 90 minutes, uh, go through the whether patient chest pain has been relieved, and what, what happened to these ST segment elevations, if they have regressed, then patient uh, can be referred to the PCI center for routine angiography. And if there's a failed thrombolysis, then this is an indication for urgent referral to the PCI centers. This is case two, 55-year-old male patient reporting uh, emergency department uh, without having on-site PCI facility of uh, seven hours uh, chest pain duration with history of sweating and breathlessness. He's a diabetic, smoker. His resting hemodynamics where he is unstable, having hypotension, tachycardia, signs of low cardiac output state, desaturation, and uh, there are features of pulmonary venous congestion. This is the ECG showing extensive anterior myocardial infarction with reciprocal changes in inferior lead, suggesting this is a proximal LED involvement. And random blood sugar shows high, and blood samples are again taken for estimating urea and creatinine. And echocardiography shows regional wall motion mo uh, abnormality in the proximal LED territory. Global ejection fraction is depressed. There is no effusion. There is no clot. There is no mitral regurgitation. His risk stratification based on those eight variables which I told you suggest there is a 10 out of 14. So he is a high risk patient, right? And since we do not have any PCI uh, on site, so usual thing, these, these patients are at a high risk of arrhythmias, should be monitored. 
and IV access should be achieved and should be propped up and oxygenation should be given. Give loading dose of NT platelets and IV, uh, the anoxaparin, IV diuretics because the patient is in the, uh, the, the pulmonary congestion, high dose statins. We need to immediately start thrombolytic therapy if you do not have PCA facilities and assess for the success at 90, 60 to 90 minutes, I told you. And based on the success, you decide whether the patient needs immediate or to be referred within three hours for doing angiography. So these are the treatment which patient needs to be on. And uh, indication for the PCIs are basically patient will fail thrombolysis, immediate referral, successful, uh, successful thrombolysis for routine angiography within three to 24 hours, if patient is in hemodynamic and electrical uh, the instability, like recurrent VTVF, heart failure, these are the patients who need to be uh, referred for urgent PCI. So I think this is all. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Negi, for your wonderful lecture on STEMI, particularly without doing a PCI. And I think the message we want to give was that uh, if the patient has a low TMI score, probably you should go for a thrombolysis. And if the patient has a high TMI score, then depending on the duration for, the, uh, for which for the transfer to a BCA capable center, you can decide whether thrombolysis can be done or a PCA should be done. Uh, the, the talk is open for any questions and comments. We give either of these two. Cost is an important consideration. I think otherwise there is no difference in terms of uh, reduction, difference in the, yeah, yeah. Sir, so within three hours of this case, yeah. you know, so whether uh, thrombolysis versus percutaneous coronary intervention, as per studies, uh, which is better? Or see, is there any difference or no difference? Three hours is slightly later. Most important thing that if you have an available facility, PCI is a preferred at three hours and above. In one hour, probably time is very, very important because each minute counts. As I told you in the graph, because mortality reduction is time sensitive. So earlier the patient come, by and large logistics, it is very difficult to take the patient to the cath lab, get done everything, the you know, lesion crossed and dilate within a matter of few minutes. So therefore, the PCA, the thrombolytic therapy should be better. But three hours onward, if you have facility. No, no. Question is within three hours, which is the modality of Modality, I think if you take patient coming. Yeah. It is individualized, you see, because uh, if you are able to achieve the PCI within 60 minutes, then you should go for PCI at three hours. If you are not able to achieve the PCI, I mean, they open the artery within three or the 60 minutes, then better to go for the uh, thrombolytic therapy becomes it. Uh, just for the information of the audience, uh, the ICMR is very supportive of uh, doing the pre thrombolysis pre hospital thrombolysis, particularly in the in the home setting. Like you can send a bike to the the person's home when a patient has a chest pain, and if that shows ST elevation MI, then ICMR will sponsor a study based on that only. That in case you can thrombolyze the patient at home. Instead of thrombolyzing the at a, a smaller hospital. So maybe some of you can try that also, right, to the ICMR for a grant. I think they'll sponsor it. Uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Nagesh for his talk on all uh, you need to know about troponins in the emergency department. Good morning, my dear seniors and uh, my dear colleagues and friends. As you know, acute coronary syndrome is a common serious clinical condition causing significant morbidity and mortality. So diagnosing an acute coronary syndrome is always a challenging. So, so acute coronary syndrome is a challenge for every emergency physician to diagnose. One must always take a detailed history, clinical assessment and ECG and importantly, the biomarkers forms the cornerstone for diagnosing these conditions. So this is the timeline of development of cardiac biomarkers in acute MI. So aspartate transaminase is the one which became first came into the biomarker in 1960. Later in 1970, we had creatine kinase, LDH, later myoglobin, and then the cardiac isoenzymes like creatine kinase MB. This has played an important role in diagnosing acute MI for more than two decades. However, it has got lack of specificity and increased 
false positive rates. So that resulted in to search for a good biomarker. So finally we came to have a troponin, which is a very good sensitive and a specific biomarker. And in 2010, we have a high sensitive troponin, which is diagnosing each and more myocardial micronecrosis also. So basically troponin, T, troponin is basically a regulatory protein which comprises of three subunits. So it is an integral part of non-smooth muscle contraction. It is attached to the tropomyosin and uh, it, is, it is seen in between the cleavage of the thin filaments of the, this one, actin. So troponin T, basically the individual function of T, C, I is, troponin T is helpful in attaching the troponin units to the actin filaments, whereas the troponin C is a calcium binding site and uh, troponin I is, inhibits the action of myosin in, in the absence of adequate calcium. So usually 92 to 95 percent of the cardiac troponins are bind to the actin filaments uh, and only the 5 to 8 percent only it is found freely unbound to the cytoplasm. Initially these are the 5 to 8 percent of the one we call it as the early releasing troponin pool which is released into the microcirculation after the acute myocardial ischemia. There is a high concentration of troponin in the myocardium, that is why it is more specific. There is a virtual absence of troponin in non-myocardial tissue. There is a high release ratio into the systemic circulation and it is directly proportional to the amount of myocardial damage. There is a rapid release into the blood in proportion to the extent of myocardial in injury. And the ability to quantify values with reproducible, inexpensive, and rapid and easily applied assays make it as a good biomarker for acute MI situation. So these are the different troponin isoforms. So we do have a troponin I and T. They are very specific, hence they are called cardiac troponin, whereas troponin C is seen in both skeletal as well as the cardiac muscle. So these are the properties of the different biomarkers. You can see that among all the biomarkers, cardiac troponins, that is T and I, are more specific to the acute MI situation. So this is the, after an insult like acute myocardial ischemia, initially the troponin start rising between 4 to 12 hours and it will be there in the peak around 12 to 48 to 72 hours and then it will be seen in the uh, serum till 7 to 14 days. Whereas creatinine kinase which rises rapidly within 3 to 6 hours and it achieves the peak in 12 to 24 hours and it will return back to the normal within 48 to 72 hours. So whenever there is a uh, repeated infarction, this one, so creatine kinase is the one which will be helpful in diagnosing the repeated infarction compared to the troponin. And you can see that even if it is a myocardial, micro-myocardial injury, that you can see there is a rise in the troponins and this is the upper reference limit. So previously thought that the troponin are released only after the myocyte necrosis or injury. However, there are multiple mechanisms are there for releasing the troponin such as normal cell, uh, cell turnover or it could be a apoptosis programmed cell death or if there is any proteolytic degradation or it can be an increased membrane permeability and sometimes membranous webs can also cause the release of the troponin. So whenever we have a myocardial ischemia, so there are some free troponins are there in the uh, serum. So these are the unbound, uh, this one, and they are released first and then later words the troponin which is bound to the myofibrils, they release slowly and you can see that the, they form a complex binary and ternary complex. So the troponins, when the myocardial damage keeps on increasing, so the increase, there are lo load of the troponin will also go high. So the fourth universal definition of MI suggests that the detection of elevated troponin value above the 99 percentile upper reference limit is defined as myocardial injury. The injury is considered acute if there is a rise and or fall of cardiac troponin values. So this is the distribution of troponin in healthy population and in patients with the acute MI. You can see that it also suggests an upper 99th percentile limit and these are the 10 percent coefficient of variation. So you can see that the conventional assays have the graph 
to the right of the 99th percentile, whereas the 10 percent assessed for the eye sensitivities fall towards the left of the curve. So, suggest that the eye sensitivity troponin can able to predict even in the normal healthy population compared to the conventional assays. So, this is the picture illustrating the detection of ranges of different cardiac troponins. You can see that even the normal cell turnover can also be picked up by the high sensitivity troponin. So, after the ischemia, there is the release of the early uh, troponin pool, which can be detected by the high sensitivity cardiac troponins. So, later when the myocardial damage is going uh, with the severe damage, you can see that the lot of troponins are elevated and here we can able to detect from the uh, prior as well as the current generation assays. So, with the time, you can see that the 99th percentile, that is the upper limit of diagnostic cutoff, gradually coming down with more and more good high sensitivity troponin assays. So, this is the one which was initially we used in 1995. The diagnostic cutoff for troponin I was 1.5. So, later it has come down to the 0 0.10 in 2003 and later in 2007 it has come down to le le more than 0 0.04. So, with the time you can see that the, the upper limit of the 99 percentile is gradually coming down. So, I will take you one brief case. So, this is a patient, 75 year old female, she is a mother of gynecologist. So, she is a case of diabetic hypertension, she was on amlopress AT tablet and also oral hypoglycemic. She underwent a TKR of right side, total knee replacement. So, in the afternoon, she suddenly developed a bradycardia, had some giddiness and then some tiredness and fatigue. So, this was the ECG. So, you can see that there is a junctional bradycardia with a heart rate of around 34. And they have given the atropine. So, after giving the atropine, there was a tachycardia with the heart rate was increased. So, then after some time again the ECG is showing this. So, you can see there is a junction rhythm with some ST uptaking in the 1 and AVL. So, this was the cardiac biomarkers. We can see that the creatine kinase MB as well as the troponin I are significantly elevated. So, at the time of admission to our hospital, so the patient was having a presentation of cardiogenic shock with systolic BP of 60-70 and uh, desaturation, ABG is showing the uh, saturation of around 60 to 70 percent and you can see that the, the ABG pH was around 7.12 with the lactate levels of 7.5. So, patient was started on inotropic support and then we given non-invasive ventilation with BiPAP and then uh, we have uh, initially put a temporary pacemaker. After six hours of stabilization, you can see the pH was improved and the lactate levels are coming down. You can just show that video. So, this was the echo done at the time of admission in the emergency department. And after stabilization, patient was taken for angiogram. You can see that the right coronary artery is normal and even the left coronary artery is also normal. So, the patient was stabilized medically and then this was the echo done at 72 hours after the stabilization. So, initially it was having a severe LV dysfunction. Now, you can see that there was the LV function was significantly improved and then the patient was stabilized, temporary pacemaker was removed. So, the diagnosis was that it is a Takatsubo cardiomyopathy. Basically, she is a 70 plus postmenopausal female coming, having a surgery for the first time in her lifetime. Because of that stress induced this one, lot of ketocalamines were released into the blood and that causes this state of severe LV dysfunction. So, whenever we come back with this sort of situation, you should always try to work up apart from the coronary causes also. So, it is also called apical ballooning syndrome, stress induced cardiomyopathy. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Sorry, I am going forward, sir. This was the echo at the time of discharge sir, this one. Sorry. Yeah. Usually, we see this sort of situation in a certain condition. One should remember that even sometimes apical sparing will not occur. In our case also, it was uh, apical was not spared. 
like it was uh, involved completely. So uh, one should always, whatever we say, this epical sparing, no? it may not be seen typically, but you should always suggest, like if the overall picture is suggestive of stress-related cardiomyopathy, we should consider the diagnosis. So the, there was only one manufacturer was there for the diagnostic troponin T assay, whereas there are multiple assays were available for troponin I. So the uh, troponin I standardization was done by this American Association and National Institute of Standards, and they have uh, recommended a calibrator for assaying this commercial troponin I assays. So an increased cardiac troponin concentration is defined as a value exceeding the 99th percentile of a normal reference population. Optimal precision as described by coefficient of variation at the 99th percentile for each assay should be less than 10 percent. So these are the different values. For the troponin T, the 99th percentile is around 0 0.01 nanogram per ml. For whereas troponin I is, it is around 0 0.04 nanogram per ml. The assay ranges is around 0 0.01 to 25 for trop T and it is 0 0.04 to 40 nanogram for trop I. So these are the some important definition. Uh, limit of uh, like a blank is the highest signal in a test which can be expected from a sample without the analyte. So this is the lower limit of detection, is the lowest concentration of an analyte in a sample which reliably can be differentiated from a sample without the analyte. And the LOQ is the smallest concentration of troponin obtained with reliable precision with a 10% coefficient of variation. So these are the values for the high sensitivity troponin T. The 99th percentile is around 40 nanogram per liter, whereas the 10% coefficient variation is 13 and the limit of detection is around 5 and limit of blank is around 3. So these are the different assays available, the conventional assays available for the troponin. And one thing you should see is the coefficient of variation for all these conventional assays are more than 10 percent. Whereas in the high sensitivity troponin assay, you can see that the variation is less than 10 percent. The coming to its use in acute coronary syndrome, it resulted in 4% absolute and 20% relative increase in the detection of type 1 MI and a corresponding decrease in the diagnosis of unstable angina. It also reduced the troponin blind interval leading to earlier detection of acute MI and it has have a higher negative predictive value for diagnosing acute MI. So this is the picture showing the high sensitivity cardiac troponin as a quantitative biomarker. You can see that it can detect the, even in the healthy individuals, the troponin is around 5 nanogram per liter and the subclinical, you can see up to the 14 nanogram per ml. So with lower troponins, there is a negative predictive value of around 99 percent, whereas with the increasing troponin, we have a positive, increasing positive predictive value. Very high amounts of troponin can be seen in like very large acute MI and in myocarditis situation. So I will be taking another case. Okay. So this is a 60 year old gentleman having a diabetic hypertension presenting with history of acute febrile illness for two days duration. And he had one episode of retrocinal discomfort which was lasted for few minutes only. So this was the ECG. Can almost the ECG is almost like a normal thing, nothing much significant in the ECG. And uh, this is the echo showing a normal LV function, concentric LVH, no regional wall motion abnormality. So one of the important thing is the cardiac biomarkers in this case. So you can see that the, at the time of admission, the troponin I value is around 35.9. So after 6 hours, there is 98.9 and after 12 hours, it is 75.5. Basically, it suggests there is an acute rise and then fall. So whenever we come across this sort of situation where is acute rise and fall, you should always suspect the acute coronary syndrome non elevation MI. So patient was stabilized, he was treated for the fever and then we did angiogram afterwards. So this was the angiogram picture. We can see that the right coronary artery is showing mild disease and this is the left coronary artery. So you can see there is a significant stenosis of the circumflex vessel and also you can, he, this is a significant stenosis and there is a proximal middle ED also showing a long segment 70 to 80 percent stenosis. So this is patient underwent an angioplasty to LAD and LCX and uh, these are the pictures. You can see there is a brisk flow in the coronaries. So basically any troponin with acute rise and acute fall, you should always suspect the acute coronary syndrome. So this is another one interesting article by Twaran Bold published in JAK 
regarding the clinical use of high sensitivity cardiac troponin. So basically, whenever the patient comes to emergency, the initial assessment should include the proper detailed history and vital science examination. You can see that by, by this, we can able to say whether it is a low likelihood of MI or high likelihood of MI. So in addition to that, the ECG showing either ST segment depression or elevation, that also helps to triage the patients. And then troponin at the zero hour and then sequentially over one, two, three hours helps to either rule out acute MI or it can be ruled in MI. In certain situations, we have to observe and then guide them properly. So these are the interesting uh, biomarker strategies for rapid assessment of patients with uh, acute coronary syndrome. So there are six different novel strategies are there. Basically very low cardiac troponin, zero to 